Thank you for joining me again for another session of Digging Deeper, where we start with a word of prayer. Father, may the words of your mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, my Lord, my Rock and my Redeemer. Amen. Last time we were talking about the, the unique day, the day when Jesus returns, the day of the wrath of God. Today I want to go on beyond that and to look at the the aftermath, the clearing up campaign that happens after this event. Strictly speaking, I suppose the, the, the great and glorious day of the Lord is the events leading up to the second coming. But this is the, the culmination of these events, the fulfilment of prophecy and the beginning of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. If you remember when Jesus was preaching in this world, he preached are the good news of the kingdom and that is what we are, are looking at now. I want to start off with some prayers to start with though, prayers recorded in scripture. The first one, probably the most famous prayer in the Bible, Matthew 6 um, verse 9. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God, which is what we're about to look at, is the first thing Jesus tells us to pray for. The coming of the kingdom of God. And this will be the fulfilment of that. There's another, another prayer that Jesus tells his disciples to make. It's in John 15. It's at the Last Supper. Um, verse 15 and 16 Jesus talking to his disciples no longer do I call you slaves for a slave does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I will give you. This I command you, that you love one another. Whatever you ask of the Father in my name. Now that doesn't mean, Lord, please may I have a Ferrari in Jesus' name. When you say something like, in the name of, um, think of the old films where uh, the the police or the, the army would hammer on a door, open in the name of the king. What that meant is with the, there was the, the power, the authority vested in them by the king. And that's what it means here. If we ask something of God with the, the authority, the um, obeying the instructions of Jesus, if we ask God, then God has bound himself to listen to that request. And what is that command? This command, of this I command you that you love one another. Love, the agape love, the self-sacrificing love, when it says that God is love. When we ask something of God in that, that type of love, that self-sacrificing love, then God is actually bound to listen. If you think of the most famous verse in the scripture, for God so loved the world, he so agapeed the world. So when we ask for something of God with that authority behind us, God will listen. And he will often intervene to prevent things happening, to change history. We have seen in Ukraine there are prayers that are being answered in miraculous ways because people are praying. There are many who are not being saved, many, many who are not being saved. But it is not going the way that Putin wants because I think people are praying. There are Christians in that country, real Christians, not just ones who claim the name, and they are praying. And God. God has stepped back from this world. He, to do something in this world, he is effectively interfering with the free will of man. 
He is stepping in and restraining man or restraining Satan. And God doesn't do that unless his people ask him to. One of the reasons I realised the rapture has to come fairly early on in the process, before much of the suffering comes on this earth, is because God has to stop his church praying. Because if they pray, he will withhold these things. And he knows he has to let mankind loose. He has to let them pay for what they do, to let the, the result of their own decisions come home to roost. But while the church are praying, he will not, because he has bound himself to listen. So that is one of the reasons I believe that the rapture will come early on in the process. God will take his church away, and then he will be able to step back and let humanity reap what they have sown. I digress. Another prayer, Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk 3. It's a section we've already looked at. It's a section of prophecy where Habakkuk sees a vision of the Messiah coming up from the land of Edom, slaughtering his way up towards Jerusalem. And he he's seen this vision and he's terrified. He knows it is a just thing. He knows that God has the nations deserve it it is the wrath of God but he's terrified and he prays this it's in verse 2 of Habakkuk 3 Lord I heard the report of you and I fear Lord revive your works in the midst of the year in the midst of the year make it known in wrath remember mercy in wrath remember mercy last time if you remember the wrath of God was quite severe but here's the prophet who has seen that who is praying to God a God who has bound himself to listen that in that wrath in that righteous anger there will be mercy and we will see some more of that later on and the last verse I want to look at before we start properly is Exodus it's Exodus 20 and it's one of the Ten Commandments and it's shows the balance of God's wrath and the balance of God's mercy and it's the fourth commandment verse uh, 4 to verse 6 you shall not make for yourself an idol notice that there is not idols it's an an idol given what we've already looked at in the past that is interesting an idol or the likeness of anything that's in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth you shall not worship or serve them for I am the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands and to those who love me and keep my commandment so here you have wrath three or four generations but then you have loving kindness which is probably the most beautiful word in scripture um, the, the Hebrew word hesed um, covenant love uh, it's a love that it's, it's a, a sense of belonging a sense of ownership and here's God with loving kindness towards his people towards those who will listen to thousands so here's, the, general, here's the, the wrath on one hand and the, the loving kindness on the other hand. All of these things we'll, we'll take into what we're about to look at and hopefully they will become more understandable as we go along. First of all, a word on timings. Um, if you remember so far we've talked about seven years, final seven years, and we've divided up into two sections two sections of three and a half years and there's various different ways scripture refers to those times the first and most obscure is a times times or it's right time times and half a time which is a bit obscure in its own right but when you put it together with the eight later on it talks about 42 months which if you go by the the 30 um 30 day average is three and a half years or if you want to be more specific, at one time it talks about 1,260 days. 
and these terms are used interchangeably throughout scripture and we, we end up with a precise figure of 1260 days equaling three and a half years and if you remember the, the two witnesses of God in the temple they prophesy for 1260 days let's read Revelations 13 and we're looking at verse 5 and 6 and this again is speaking of the Antichrist and I want you to just look at the timings of this there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies an authority to act for 42 months was given to him and he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven 42 months there and that's we're seeing as I've told you is 1260 days so from the time that the Antichrist kills the the two witnesses and sits upon the throne in the temple in Jerusalem there is 1260 days the events we talked about last time happen on the 1261st day and we know that because of what Jesus says in Matthew on the, the Olivet Discourse when he's talking to his disciples about the events of the, the, the coming up to the, the kingdom. And it's Matthew 24 and it's verse 21 and 22. And this is where he's talking about the, he's just spoken about the abomination of desolation. That is where the Antichrist sits on the throne in the temple in Jerusalem and declares himself as God. And that's after he's killed the two witnesses. So verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred from the beginning of the world, and not, and not nor will ever be. And unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. What that means is... The events of the Great Tribulation, the second half of those seven years, will not be able to allow to go on more than one second beyond the 1,260 days. God has given himself half of those seven years. He has given Satan the other half of those seven years. It will not go on beyond that. It will be stopped. Therefore, the Antichrist on that day, firstly, is killed by the Jesus and then somewhat ironically is raised from the dead and then thrown into hell. Didn't quite go as it's planned. But there are other periods of days mentioned. If we go back to the book of Daniel, once again we have the, the, the three and a half years, the times, times and half a times, but you'll see some other dates mentioned here. Let's go to Daniel and it's chapter 12 and it's verse 5 to 12. This is coming to the end of the prophecies that Daniel's seen. And if you're confused by it all, so was Daniel. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river, and the other on the other bank of the river. And one said to a man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be until the end of these wonders? And I heard the man dressed in lin linen, who was above the waters of the river, as he raised his right hand and his left hand and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for times or time times and half a time and as soon as they had finished shattering the power of the holy people all these events would be completed so once again that's three and a half years 1260 days and it would finish at that point it would finish the reign of satan the reign of the antichrist but it doesn't quite finish there. As for me, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said to me, Dan, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end times. Many will be purged, purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished 
and the abomination of, of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Hmm. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335th day. Oh, that's interesting. What on earth is that about? There is there a section of 75 days after the the death of the Antichrist and the return of Jesus when something happens and at the end of that time there is a time of blessing. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335th day. So there's 75 days after the second coming where something happens and at the end of that time there's a blessing. Now you think that's fairly odd but consider the, the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was resurrected on what we call Easter Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. Did he immediately go back up to heaven? No. He actually hung around for 40 days. And during those 40 days, he had various jobs to do, various things to put in order. He needed to um, pull his disciples together again to get Peter to strengthen Peter and the others. He needed to talk to various people. He needed to, to give instructions to build them up. And then you have the, the ascension of 40 days. Does the, the church immediately start? No, it doesn't. It's another 10 days until the, the 50th day at the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. That is when the Holy Spirit falls. That is when the church is born on the day of Pentecost. So there's actually a gap of 50 days there between the resurrection and the foundation of the church. And it's the same principle here. There's a gap here of 75 days between the, the second coming and the, found, the foundation of the kingdom of God on earth. That kingdom we've been asked to pray for we've been commanded to pray for, that kingdom that the, the Jews have been longing for, for their entire lives and many, many lives. And there's a number of things that need to be sorted out in those 75 days. And that's what we're going to be looking at now. I've, I've nicknamed this next section, The Saints Come Marching In. Can you remember that old song, When the Saints Come Marching In? I want to be amongst that number when the saints come marching in. This is what is about to happen. The saints are going to be coming marching in. This is a victory celebration. There's some sorting out, there's some tidying up, but there's also a victory celebration. There is a the wedding supper of the Lamb. For when Jesus came from heaven, he did not come on his own. The church was following him. The bride of Christ was following him down to earth. We will be following him on that day. That's the first set of saints come marching in. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. And it's the first four verses. And this is the events immediately after the, the second coming and the, the battle. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hands. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and, the, and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Have you noticed that's thrones plural? Not singular. It's not Jesus sitting on a throne at this stage. This is thrones plural. So what's going on here? The answer to that is actually in Luke, and it's 20, Luke 22, um, verse 28. It's something that Jesus said to his disciples at the, the Last Supper again. So Luke 22, verse 28. You are those who stood by me in my trials, 
Just as the Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Thrones were set up. Jesus promised thrones to the twelve disciples. The twelve disciples, part of the church, part of the bride of Christ, will be present. There's two uses of the word judge in, in scripture. The first is, as we would think of it nowadays, a judge who looks at the law, passes sentence, someone's guilty or innocent. The other form of that judgment was to actually to, to be a ruler, to be a leader. Um, so, a, so Gideon would be a, was a judge. He led the people. He was their ruler. In this case, I think the the disciples are set up as leaders in Israel. So this is the the returning church, and the disciples are leaders. Each of them in charge of a different tribe. Now it's interesting. Obviously, I think at that stage in the Last Supper, Judas had already left. So who's the twelfth disciple? Um, the disciples themselves, they, they choose two people, they drew lots, and a chap called Matthias became one of the twelve, one of the twelve apostles. And it may well be him, it may equally be the Apostle Paul, because in one sense he was personally chosen by Jesus. It's not our call to make, it is God's call. But there will be the twelve apostles sitting on thrones, and they will be put in charge of the people of Israel. They will chart each one of them of one of the tribes of Israel at the return of Jesus. Who are they put in charge of? You go to Zechariah for that. And in Zechariah 8. And the first verse, starting the first verse. Then the word of the Lord of hosts said to me, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am exceeding jealous for Zion. Yes, with a great wrath I am jealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, and it will be called the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of their age, and the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the streets. Thus said the Lord of hosts, If it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, will it also be too difficult in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts? This prophecy was was given when the city was in ruins and they thought they were condemned to dwindle away forever. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the lands of the east and from the lands of the west, and I will bring them back uh, to live in Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. One of the first gatherings together is of the Jewish people who are alive on this earth. Those who survived the, the Great Tribulation, those who were in Bosra, those who were hiding, hiding um, somewhere near Bosra, those who were in Jerusalem, those people who were scattered abroad. Um, at the time when Jerusalem is taken, half of them are killed, the other half are taken into captivity. They are, they are scattered around the place and we'll see that in a minute. So one of the first things that that God does, that Jesus does, is bring his Jewish people, the Jewish remnant, back to Israel from all around the world. And the, the trumpet call goes out and they are called back. That The saints of Israel who are alive are called back. But not merely that. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 30. And it's verse 5 to 9. For thus saith the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there is no peace. Ask now, and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in childbirth? And why have all your faces turned pale? Alas, for the day is great, 
and there is none like it. It is a time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. That is a description of what we've just been looking at over the past months. It shall come about in that day. This is the, the, um, the unique day. Declares the Lord of hosts that I will break his yoke off their neck. Who is he? It's the Antichrist and Satan. I will break his yoke off their necks and I will tear off their bonds and strangers will no longer make them slaves. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up for them. The last bit, David their king whom I will raise up for them. I remember talking to some Christians, they, they have looked at this bit and they think, oh, it's, it's just it's talking about Jesus. It, it would be ridiculous to think of King David coming back to life. If you look in the context of everything else that's happening, I think that's the least ridiculous thing to happen. In, in fact, scripture says more, has more on the subject. Go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37 and starting at verse 24. And this is after the section where Ezekiel has been talking about the Valley of Dry Bones. If you remember that, Ezekiel shown a vision of a Valley of Dry Bones. And God asked him a question, can these bones live? To which Ezekiel says, Lord, you know. And then he watches as the, the bones come together. And then muscle and sinew goes on them. And then flesh goes on. Then skin goes on them. And then eventually God breathes life into them. So the answer is, can these dry bones live? The answer is, oh yes, they can. Even David's old dry bones can live. So let's read this section. Ezekiel 37, 24. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and I will walk by my and they will walk by my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. And they will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it. And their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I don't think that's talking about Jesus. I think that's talking about King David. If the church comes back and the twelve apostles come back, why not King David? So you have Israel with the twelve apostles in charge of each tribe. King David in charge of all those. And Jesus in charge over the, over the top. Of those people who have survived but it goes further than that there's more saints to come marching in yet let's go to Genesis to Genesis 17 to the promise made to Abraham it's Genesis 17 it's verse 3 to verse 8 Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying as for me behold my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall I call you Abraham, but you shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations from you and kings from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you. And your descendants after you throughout all their generations from everlasting covenant. <coughs> But be God, um, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give you and your descendants after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, for I will be their God. And I will give you, this is talking to Abraham, during his lifetime, Abraham owned one field with a cave in it, which he paid far too much money for. And that was it. But here's God promising, I will give you this land personally. Well, you can say, oh, well, he gave it to the people of Israel. That will do. Yeah, that, that, that sort of fits it. Except, can you remember Jesus talking to the... Um, uh, the Sadducees, they were trying to catch him out with a question about marriage. Um, the woman who was married to seven men and they all died, whose wife would she be in the in the kingdom, at the, the resurrection? They didn't believe in it. And Jesus' answer to them, 
Well, part of his answer to them was this. You are in error because you do not understand scripture. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's what he said when he was speaking to Moses. I am. I am is the name of God. I am that I am. So Jesus pointed out that God, by his very name, says, I am. Not I was, not they are dead and gone. I am now the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So the very name of God means he still is. God has promised the Holy Land to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And he will fulfil that promise because they will become marching in too. In fact, I believe that all the Old Testament saints, those who truly believed, so the Elijahs, the Elishas, the Moses, the, the Daniels, all of them will come back. All of them will be brought back. There's a wedding ceremony and these are the guests. They've been invited in to be part of it, part of the joy of this celebration. But there's more. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. So, so far you've got the church, you've got the Old Testament saints. Revelation chapter 20, we're looking at verse 4 to 6. And I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is what we call the tribulation saints. Those who during those seven years after the church has gone, after the church has been taken in the rapture, who refuse to bow down to the Antichrist, to refuse to accept his power, who they may not be Christians as we would understand it because they may not go to church every Sunday, they may not recite the correct creeds, they may not do the correct religious things, but by their actions they prove their faith. They reject Satan and they choose God. And they die for it. And yet here they are resurrected. They are brought back to life. So you have the saints coming marching in. And I think the 144,000 witnesses will be part of this. These are all the people throughout history who have accepted God in faith will be invited in for this wedding ceremony. I'm not quite sure how this works to be honest because you will then have a group of people on earth who will be immortal who will not die they will not have part of the second death the second death by the way is the, the lake of fire there will be those who survive on earth who will still be mortal. There will be those who will be immortal. There is a section in the, in the book of First John. John who writes the, the Revelation, who sees that. Um, I'm not sure he understood this himself. Let's go to 1 John. And um, we're looking at chapter 3. And he's looking at it from the point of view, imagine you're a child. When you're a child, you're full of potential. You don't know what you're going to be, but you're not given any authority you're not given any responsibility when you grow up uh, into to adulthood then you are given responsibility you're given a job to do you're given a role in life and that's how he's, he's looking at this so uh, uh, 1 John chapter 3 verse 1 see how great a love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God and such we are for this reason the world does not know us 
because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that we will appear, that when he appears we shall be like him, because we will see him and be as he is. When he appears we will be like him. When Jesus was raised from the dead, if you remember the stories, he appeared and disappeared. He could walk through locked doors. He could be in Galilee one minute and Jerusalem the next. Will we be like that? I don't know. Another section when Jesus once again was talking with the um, the incident when he's talking to the, uh, the the Pharisees, or sorry, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, about the marriage. And he says to them that when we are raised, we will not, we will be like the angels. We will not be given, uh, taken in marriage or given in marriage. We will be like the angels. So that's Jesus himself saying that we will be like the angels. I don't know how immortal and mortal people will mix on earth, but it is already happening now inasmuch as the angels themselves are on the earth. God has put them as guardian angels on the earth to protect us. One day we will know how much work they did behind the scenes without us seeing them. Um, in the, the book, The Screwtape Letters, for those of you who have read it at the end, the, the, the main protagonist, the main hero, dies. And it seems tragedy, but at the moment he dies, he becomes aware of what was around him. He becomes aware of the guardian angels that all his life were looking after him. And he becomes aware of what's been going on behind the scenes. And then he becomes aware of God Almighty when he is taken into his presence. What we will be, I do not know. The Apostle John did not know. I don't know when we come marching in what we will be like. We won't be like we are now though. So will the earth just consist of immortal beings? No. Let's look at Psalm 2. Psalm 2. This is a psalm about the the wrath of God against the nations. It sums up all the events or, that we've been looking at. The, the great and glorious day of the Lord. It ends though like this. So we're looking at verse 7 to 12. I will surely tell of the decrees of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's obviously Jesus. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like earthenware. Therefore, kings, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the sun that he does not become angry and you perish away. For his wrath is soon kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Hmm. So here's God saying, I will give you the nations as an inheritance. And then we have the, the, rod, the idea of the rod of iron breaking, shattering pots and things, which is a good description of what happens at the events of the second coming the unique day but at the same time you still have these kings existing after this event and if God gave Jesus the nations as an inheritance would he just destroy them all utterly remember what I said about showing mercy in wrath remember mercy there will be mercy shown to those who are on the earth even those who have not believed that Jesus is the Son of God, are not Christians as we would understand them, 
And Jesus himself describes this incident. It's in Matthew, Matthew 25. It's uh, and verse 30, 31, Matthew 25, 31. It's one of the parables Jesus tells at the end of the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse, if you remember, is when he's talking about these events, talking about the events of the end times. There are a number of different parables he gives. This is the last of them. So Matthew 25, 31. This is a very misunderstood parable. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. Many times you've probably heard of this and people have said this is the end, end times when God says, right, you're a Christian, you're not. You're a Christian, you're not. That is incorrect. Put it in context with what we've looked at. It is very specific. It is very accurate. It's not a allegory. This is Jesus coming with the angels, coming up to Jerusalem. And in this 75 days, the nations are gathered before him. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous... Interesting they're called righteous here. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did this to one of, the, one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. If we take this in the traditional way that many Christians have looked at it, this will mean that salvation is due to works. That you have to be nice and kind to people and, well, do things that God expects us to do. To feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit people in prison, to, to do all those things. But that's what you have to do in order to be saved. But we know from other parts of scripture that is not the case. Let's read on a bit more. Then he also said to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer all, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteousness, righteous to eternal life. You notice these people... The, the righteous ones at the beginning didn't even know who Jesus was. They didn't even know the Lord. They just did the right thing to one of these brothers of mine, brothers and sisters. So what does this mean? If this isn't uh, an allegory of salvation, what, what is it? Because it talks about eternal life, it talks about judgment. Let's go to the book of Joel. book of Joel, and it's chapter 3. Verse 1 to 3. For behold, in those days and at that time, I will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, and I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. We talked about that valley last time, the valley that, that leads up to Jerusalem, that the, the battle rages along. And I will enter into judgment with them on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel whom they scattered amongst the nations and have divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people 
they have traded a boy for a harlot, and they have sold a girl that they may have drink. So one of the events of the, the second coming is Jesus will gather all the nations of the world that remain into this valley and there will be a time of judgment and they will be judged according to the way they have treated the people of God. And if you think about it, the, the danger in a world where there's a massive worldwide persecution of the Jewish people, of Jewish believers, of any believer, where the Antichrist was setting out to destroy them, where you feel like a price had been put on their head, when the yellow stars had been sewn onto the clothes, and when anybody who trades with them will be treated in the same way. To show mercy, to show kindness, to someone who has been so persecuted by the powers that are in charge of the world, that is a, an extremely brave act. That is something that God would look down and go, yes. It may not be what we understand as the gospel, but it is an act of faith. It is an act of rejection of the powers of Satan and accepting the, the judgment values of God. If that sounds a bit strange, let's go to Mark. Let's see the words of Jesus. Mark 9, and it's verse 38. And it's the disciples talking to Jesus. And John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out a demon in your name, and we tried to prevent him, because he did not follow us. But Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who can perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives a cup of water to drink, gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as a follower of Christ, truly so I say unto you, he will not lose his reward. The time that the, the Jewish believers, the Christian believers have been going through will be so horrific that anybody who shows them kindness will be seen by God. And when it comes to this period of judgment, he will pull the nations together and he will go, you lot, you sold my people into slavery. You profited out of them. You, you're out of it. You lot. You showed kindness. You showed mercy. You're into the, my kingdom. These are not saints as we would understand them. They probably will be shortly afterwards, but their actions have saved them. Because it was such an act of faith to do what they did, such a brave act to do what they did, that they are invited into the kingdom of God. They're still mortal, they're not immortal, they're not, they've not yet gone through that, that resurrection. <clears throat> but they have been invited into the kingdom of God because of their acts. This is in wrath, remember mercy. God looks at those who have given mercy and he gives them mercy. There is a, <clears throat> a, a Christian martyr in this country called St Albans, I don't know if you've heard of him. You obviously heard of the town. Alban was a, a Roman citizen at the time that the, the Romans were in this country and Christianity had just started to spread throughout the country. And there were some missionaries, Christian missionaries, and the Romans were hunting them because at this time it was still illegal. They were hunting them um, throughout the country and Alban took them into his house he, he hid them and he hid them there for a few days and they talked to him and he got to know them and eventually I think someone betrayed the, their presence in the house and the, the soldiers were sent and they come in and they saw this man wearing a what was a, a cloak that showed himself to be a Christian and they arrested him and they dragged him back before the governor of the area and when he got there he found out it actually wasn't the Christian missionary 
St uh, Alban had taken the cloak of this man and put it on himself. He was taken away and the Christian escaped. And because he had taken the cloak, the judge decided that he would take the, uh, the place of the Christian in execution. And he was beheaded. If I had my way, St Alban would be the patron saint of this country and not St George. That is a true saint. He wasn't properly baptised, I don't know. He didn't do all the things that we say that you have to be to be a Christian today. But his actions showed his faith. I think that is similar to what it will be on that day when the sheep and the goats are separated. However this works, there will be those on earth who have survived this time of tribulation, this time of persecution. There will be Jews, there will be Gentiles, and they will all be brought together into one kingdom. One kingdom ruled by one king. Let's go to Zechariah. And it's chapter 14, verse 16. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations who went up against Jerusalem. Notice that these are the countries that went up to attack Jerusalem under the command of the Antichrist. Yet there are people of those nations who are left. They will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, if you've got the old, old version of the Bible. I'm thinking of Ukraine at the moment and we are hearing many atrocities that the Russian troops are performing. I wonder if there are other hidden stories we haven't heard about yet of Russian troops who have come across Ukrainians hiding and have deliberately turned a blind eye or have helped. I wonder how many secret stories there are of those who would not accept what their leaders are telling them to do. How many Christians, I wonder, amongst that army who are rebelling against what they are being told to do. And whenever they get a chance are allowing the Ukrainians to live and to escape. I wonder how many stories there are like that that we have not yet heard, may never hear. There will be stories like that at that time as well. People in the army of Satan who will not follow his instructions will give that cup of water, will give freedom, will give help, will give security. Even of the nations, not necessarily of the, the, the ten world powers, but of the other nations that have been fooled into coming to this battle. Because if you remember at the beginning of Armageddon, he calls every nation that he can get hold of to the, to the field of Armageddon. He wants more than just his own power. He wants every power he can get hold of. The Feast of Booths. Oh, if you look at the, the Feast of Israel, the, the Holy Feast of Israel, there's seven of them um, from Leviticus 23. Each one of them follows through the life of Jesus. So the Passover follows through the, the death of Jesus. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the, the pure holy life of Jesus. The Feast of First Fruits is the resurrection of Jesus. The Feast of Pentecost is the, the birth of the church, the falling of the Holy Spirit. You have the Feast of Trumpets which is the warning calls prior to the events of the great and glorious day. You have the, um, the Feast, the Day of Atonement, which is the day when the Jewish people realise their sin against their Messiah and they repent and are forgiven. And he returns. And then you have the final one, the Feast of Booths, the feast that was to celebrate the, the, the days when they came out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, they were living in these ramshackle little huts in their wilderness. And it was specifically to remember as well that they, they were living in these huts, but now they're in the promised land. And now they're in the promised land and they decorated these huts with, with fruit and the, the, the harvest. And they celebrated. 
so this is the, the celebration, the incoming, the ingathering. The saints have come marching home. They are now in the kingdom, the promised land. This is the celebration, the Feast of Booths. It speaks of that day. These are some of the events I think happen in those 75 days. The judgment of the nation, the gathering of the Jews, the, the coming in of the Old Testament saints, the coming of the tribulation saints, the setting up of the rule of the kingdom, however that's going to be. Let's go to Psalm 24. This, I think, is the 75th day. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and all who dwell in it. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, who has not sworn deceitfully. He who has received a blessing from the Lord, Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face, even Jacob, Shelah. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Shelah. I think that's going to be a celebration to be at. It's been sorted out. The judgment has been made. Now the kingdom has been established and this is the this is the enthronement day. This is the day when the saints come marching into Jerusalem. When the kingdom is set up on earth. Yet yeah, there's actually more. There's more. Let's go back to Daniel. Daniel 8. It's verse 9. Daniel 8 verse 9 onwards. There's more days that need to be taken an account of here. We've covered the 75 after the, the return of Jesus, but there's more days. So Daniel 8, verse 9 onwards. Out of one of them shall come a rather small... This is talking here about the Greek Empire. And he's talking about the small horn that grows up, which later we obviously have discussed is the Antichrist. Out of one of them shall come a rather small horn, which shall grow exceedingly towards the south, towards the east, and towards the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heavens, and caused some of the host of the stars to fall to the earth. It trampled them down. It even magnified, magnified itself to be equal to the commander of the host. It removed the regular sacrifice to him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of the transgression, the hosts will be given over to the, ho the, um, to the horn along with a regular sacrifice. It will fling truth to the ground and perform, uh, form its own will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another one saying to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, until the holy place will be properly restored. Two thousand three hundred days. There's a new one. What is this on about? Once again we have the same idea that this countdown starts from the moment the Antichrist takes over the, the church, takes over the, the temple, stops the regular sacrifice to God and sits himself in the, the, tab the tabernacle. But this time it goes on for quite a lot longer. In fact it's two years, 320 days after the, the second coming until the holy place will be properly restored. 
What does that mean? Go back and in your mind to the when the Jews were turned from exile, from Babylon, back to Jerusalem. One of the first things they did was actually to clear the, the temple altar. It took them a, a couple of weeks, I think, they cleared the altar. They set up the altar and then they started sacrificing. But the temple itself wasn't completed for many, many decades after this event. And the walls, hundreds of years after this event. There was a period when the, the temple was in ruins. Consider what's happened in the temple prior to this. The Antichrist has taken up his residence in it. He has, while he was there, he sat on the throne. When he went off to do other battles, he put a, a statue of himself, a living statue of himself in that temple. And that was still there when the Antichrist was destroyed and when Jesus got to, the, to Jerusalem. And if you remember from the early day, it talks about an extra 40 days and then an extra 35 days to make it up to 75 days. It would seem from that reference that the abomination of desolation, this statue is left standing in the temple, even while Jesus is outside judging the nations. It's still there. Why? Remember I talked about the, the fourth commandment earlier on? You shall not make an idol. That idol was able to put people to death. It was able to say that person is not worshipping me. That person is not worshipping me. Yes, that one is. He can live. Now that idol is acting as a witness in the prosecution. I wonder if it's still speaking. I wonder if it's saying, oh yes, that one, he worshipped me, that one, he worshipped me, that one, no, they didn't. It's now a witness against those people. And whether it's allowed to speak or not, I don't know. But I wonder if the people can see it when they're standing in that valley of judgment. Whether they can see the idol they bowed down to. Eventually that idol will be destroyed, but I don't think it will be until after the judgment is passed. It is the evidence. It is exhibit A for the prosecution. That idol is destroyed, but that temple has been contaminated. It's been contaminated by the presence of Satan, by the presence of the Antichrist. It has con been contaminated by the, the, the murder that has been perpetrated from there. That is where the, the, the false religion was set up. Is that the type of place that Jesus would move back into? Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 40. Ezekiel was prophesying at the time when the, the original temple was being destroyed. He was in exile in Babylon, one of the early waves of exiles. Um, back in Israel, the people were rebelling and the Babylonians were coming in and they destroyed the temple. But even as he is giving many prophecies of fear, of judgment, God gives him this prophecy from chapter 40 to the end of the book. Let's read it. So chapter 40, verse 1. In the 25th year of our exile... At the beginning of the year, on the tenth month, in the fourteenth year, after the city was taken, on the same day, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me there. In the vision of God, he brought me to the land of Israel, and he set me on a very high mountain, and on, and on it, to the south, was, uh, was a structure like a city. So he brought me there. And behold, there was a man whose appearance was like, like bronze, and a line of flax and a measuring rod was in his hand. And he was standing in the gateway, and he said to me, Son of man, see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and give attention to all that I am about to show you. For you have been brought here in order to be shown, to show it, and to declare it for all of Israel to see.
you then have many chapters of Ezekiel being led around this temple. And this man has a measuring rod in his hand. Different measurements are given for this. Um, a cubit is the distance between your elbow and the top like that. So the problem is, it's the same problem we have with the yard in this country, which is different between the nose and the end of your hand, in as much as if people had different measurements for different lengths of arm. Um, so, for instance, the Babylonian cubit was slightly longer than the original Jewish cubit. It was one of their cubits plus a hand span on the top. This measuring rod was six cubits, a Babylonian cubits long. And the this angel, as I believe it is, takes Ezekiel around and measures in detail this temple. And it's a temple. And according to different measurements of what you think, it's probably just under about a mile square. The, the outer limits of this temple. Which is far bigger than could possibly sit on the current area of Jerusalem. And yet here's this temple in Jerusalem. If you remember the event, some of the events of the Second Coming, when Jesus' foot touches the Mount of Olives, there is an enormous earthquake. And one side of this, this fault line goes upwards and becomes a mighty mountain. The other side drops downwards and becomes like a plain. The whole earth is struck by mount earthquakes throughout this period and the geology of the world is changed. Where there's mountains there's plains, where there's plains there's mountains. The whole area of Israel, of Jerusalem and Israel is changed. There is a new site for a new temple. The old one will be wiped away. The one that was contaminated by the Antichrist will be wiped away. And a new temple will be built. And it takes, I think, two years, 320 days, to build this temple. It's a long passage, I won't read it all. You can read it yourself. There's many people who have tried to draw up maps from it and plans. But I want to go to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47, first 12 verses. And when you think of this, I want you to think of the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, when it was first set up, there was a river flowing through it, which split up and became four different rivers flowing through the, the, the world at that time, bringing life to that world. So Ezekiel 47, verse 1. And he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing out from under the threshold of the house towards the east. From the house uh, for the house faced east and the water was flowing down from under from the right side of the house from the south side of the altar if you can remember one of the things that happened when jesus's foot touched the mount of olives it split and there was also a river produced at the same time both both through the mediterranean sea and to the towards the dead sea giving life wherever it went this now this temple is built on that spring he brought me by way of the north gate and led me round to the outside, to the outer gate, by way of the gate that faces east. And behold, the water was trickling out from under the south side. When the man went forward uh, towards the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits and he led me through the water and it reached up to my ankles. Again, he measured a thousand cubits. Um, and led me through the water. The water was up to my knees. Again he measured a thousand cubits and led me through the waters and it was up to my loins. He measured a thousand cubits and it was a river that could not be forded. For the water had risen, enough water to swim in, a river that could not be forded. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now, when I returned, behold, the banks of the rivers, there were many trees on one side and on the other. And he said to me, these waters go out to the eastern region and go down into the Arabah. When they go towards the sea, that's the Dead Sea, being made to flow into the sea, the water of the sea will become fresh. 
And it will come about that every living creature will swarm in that place. There the river goes, it will, it will live. And there will be many fish. And those waters, uh, waters go there and other will become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it from Engedi to El Elam. Um, and there will be a place of spreading of nets. Their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea. Many, uh, very many, but its, swarm, uh, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Salt was an important thing in, in Jewish culture and indeed for life. By the river banks, on one side and on the other side, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because of the water flowing from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for healing. Here we have the beginning of the restoration of the earth. The earth is in a post-apocalyptic state, literally. The seas were turned to blood, the rivers were turned to blood. The, um, there were blacknesses, there were plagues. Now God is starting to put the world together again. He could snap his fingers and put the whole thing together again, but I don't think he does. I think it's a gradual process. In the same way that Adam and Eve were told to tend the garden, I think one of our jobs when we get back is to tend the earth and to rejuvenate it. But here we see this, this stream of living water coming from the very altar of the sanctuary. And where it goes, it brings life. And it brings healing. And I think this is literal. And we know that there's places on earth at this stage which are still desolate um, because some of the prophecies we've already read, the, the battle around Bosra, it talks about the area of Bosra being left desolate forever. It talks about Babylon, Babylon the Great, the city being left desolate forever. There's a section at one stage it talks about the, the land of Egypt, the Nile, being dried up. These are things that are happen, but over the course of the next thousand years, God starts to put things right, gradually, slowly maybe, but he starts to rebuild the world as it should be. Let's go to Isaiah, chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, it's verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spring of the Lord will the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what he sees, nor make decision by what he hears. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with a rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be on the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, and the young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox, the nursling child will play at the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand into a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. The mountain of the Lord 
Israel will become, this part of Israel will become a mountain, on the top of it will be this temple. This is where Jesus will take up his residence. There will be, there's other sections in Ezekiel, it talks about the, the, the splitting up of the land of Israel between the tribes and the city of Jerusalem. But this will be the mountain of the Lord, and in this mountain, so many of the things that we see in the world will change. If the lion and the lamb can lay down together, if a child can play with a cobra and not be stung. So much of the curse that was brought about after Eden will be undone. This will be a new Eden. And this will be a place where the peoples of the world can come to, to hear the wisdom of Jesus. This sounds like heaven. But I want to put a discordant note into this. Let's go to Zechariah 14. We've already heard this note before, but I want to point it out to you. Zechariah 14, and it's verse 16 to 19. And it will come about that anyone who is left of all the nations that go up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Amen to that. So there's going to be a yearly celebration of the beginning of the kingdom. And it will be that whichever of the families of earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the families of Egypt does not go up, uh, does not enter, there will be no rain will fall on them. It is. It will be a plague that will go which the Lord will smite the nations which do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Hmm. Early on we talked about a rod of iron. Here is a rod of iron. There will be those on earth who will rebel against it they rebel against the rule of God something else let's go to Isaiah chapter 65 and it's verse 19 to 20 Isaiah 65 19 to 20 I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people and there will no longer be heard in her vo the voice of weeping and the sound of crying no longer there will be an infant who lives but a few days, or a man who does not live to live out his days, for the youth will die at the age of a hundred, and one who does not reach the age of a hundred will be thought accursed. Death will still be in this kingdom. Once again, it will not be for those who have already had the first resurrection. But those who survived alive, death will still reign in their lives. How that works, I don't know. But death will still be in this kingdom. And people will still have the option to rebel against the king. There will be consequences, but they will still have the option to rebel against the king. This kingdom lasts for a thousand years. It's what we call the millennium. Of Jesus ruling from Jerusalem over the earth. And of those who are with him, those that comfort ourselves, maybe others, I don't know how this will work. Restoring the earth, renewing the earth, undoing the, the evils that have happened to it. Bringing it back to what it should be. It will be a time of perfect rule. It will be a time of perfect justice. It will be a time of perfect leaders. <laughs> Something we are desperately short of at the moment. We shall look at that time in more detail on the next session, which I hope will be the last session of this. I want to finish with the mica. I want to finish on a, a, on a high note. Mica chapter 4. That's seven verses. Uh, one to seven. 
It will come about in the last days that the mountain of the Lord will be established as the chief mountain. It will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty um, for my, mighty um, distant nations they will hammer their swords into plowshares their spears into pruning hooks nation will not lift up sword against nation never again will they train for war each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree well, um, with no one to make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken throughout all the uh, peoples will walk each in the name of his God that's strange isn't it although each of the peoples will walk in the name of his God as for us we will walk in the name of the Lord our God um, God forever and ever in that day declares the Lord I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts even those whom I have afflicted I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever as for you tower of the flock hill of the daughter of Zion to you it will come even the former domination will come the kingdom of the daughters of Jerusalem. This will be as close as you can get to heaven without being in heaven. As close as you can get to it in the mortal realm. In the next session we shall look at this thousand years or we shall look at the end of this thousand years and see what humanity makes of a perfect ruler and we hopefully will come to the final judgment let's end in a word of prayer Lord one day we will be amongst that number that come marching in when you raise your saints those that have held your name those that have stood up for you in situations far worse than we have ever faced Lord there will be such a day of celebration and a day that this earth has longed for of justice and peace and prosperity of righteous leaders of holy judges Lord your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Amen and Amen